for coming here and for being interested in Phoenix. Since we are lucky, we are coming. Everybody is fitting in with all the problems. So let's get going. I'm going to talk about uh, Boost Phoenix version 3. That's a new version which has been um, added to, to the SVN only a couple of weeks ago. We actually were planning to have it ready for a release which was initially planned for uh, start of, you know, of May, I believe. But for different reasons it got, got delayed and now we will uh, see it after who's going to come in. Uh, up front, say a, a kind of um, general remarks. I personally have no relationship to Phoenix in terms of contributing code. The my, main author is Thomas Heller, and just in case you, you haven't seen him, that's him. At least that's a picture he sent me because I've never seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he was a summer of Google Summer of Code student in, in 2010 and he ported uh, or he wrote the new version of, of Phoenix um, over the uh, Google Summer of Code project. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you a bit of the history and, and we'll go into some details there. Uh, that's not looking good. Come in, guys. Oh, should be, should be small. And I have to admit that I did it for selfish reasons, because I like that room better. <laughs> but you, you proved me wrong. Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I give a short history about, of Phoenix. Uh, we'll give you a short overview of why we thought we need a new version. Give you some motivation for Phoenix in the first place. Um, I will talk about Phoenix as C++ and C++ and you will see how um, what I mean um, when I say that. Uh, for those of you who attended the ACO talk this morning, uh, we will build on, on ACO a bit by building a simple ACO echo server using just Phoenix. Um, as you might know, the new Phoenix is built on top of Boost Proto. Um, it's actually the workhorse um, underneath the Phoenix library. So I, I, I feel obliged to give some introduction to that, very short. Um, don't be afraid, mm, I'm trying to keep it as concise as possible and if you're interested in getting more details about Proto, you will have plenty of opportunity this, during this week. Um, I already told some people that this conference should be probably called Joel Falku Con and not Boost Con <laughs> <laughs> because he's the one who's giving four talks mainly about Proto and, and things around it. So please attend those talks if you need more details, details there. Um, that's roughly the first half of the talk. In the second half of the talk I will give you a couple of um, examples of the new Phoenix extension mechanism because that's where Phoenix really shines and where you can build very amazing things um, based on, on the Phoenix library. Uh, I am going to build two versions of a parallel 4 construct directly in Phoenix. I will give you an overview of what you can do when you represent code as data and that's essentially what Phoenix is doing for you. And in the end I give you a couple of not getting any audio. You are not. I did. Switch it on. <coughs> Battery. I just replaced those batteries. No, it's it's blinking red. I have no idea why. No, it's that battery. That's that's a that's a sound signal. Okay, that should work. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you put it on the outside of your pocket instead of inside. Do you think it, it my pocket somehow? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. You should stop lining it with toy. I'm getting sound now. You're getting sound. Can I put it back in my pocket? Does it work? No, no sound. Oh, okay, cool. Great. Okay, and in the end, I, I will give you a short overview about the compile times. Okay, what's Boost Phoenix? Um, 
Phoenix has been developed by Joel de Guzman in, I, I believe, 10 years ago um, as a supporting library of spirit. Later on, Eric has contributed to it and other people have contributed to it. And Thomas was the one who implemented a new incarnation of the Phoenix library last year during his Google Summer of Code project. Phoenix passed the boost review um, in 2008 actually, in November 2008, and that's where uh, my relationship with Phoenix comes in because I was a review ma manager at that, po uh, at that uh, particular review. Uh, the, the main discussions which came up during that Phoenix review were centered not around the library. Everybody was convinced that this library is excellent and should be accepted into Boost. But uh, Phoenix overlaps very much with existing functionality in Boost, like uh, bind, lambda, and other things. Uh, actually, you can call Phoenix being a library uh, like lambda on steroids, actually. <coughs> and um, so most of the discussions went around that fact, how can we unify the use of these uh, facilities in Boost? And for that reason, uh, Phoenix got accepted in 2008, but with some additional um, comments which are, and some additional requirements which uh, we, we thought that the authors have to, have to uh, implement in order to make Phoenix really a nice fit in into Boost. And uh, that has been addressed by the rewrite in, in the Google Summer of Code project. And we had a mini review early this year where we fully accepted Phoenix into Boost and it's now an SVN. And starting with the next Boost version, it will be, will be shipped. <coughs> um, Phoenix version 2 and version 1 um, 10 years ago were developed as a supporting library for Spirit um, and it exposes similar features to Boost Bind, Boost Lambda and it was using some kind of hand-rolled expression templates. Actually when, Boost, uh, when Phoenix was developed in, in the first place it had actually no, almost no expression template mechanism but it was based on pure operator overloading and we will see a couple of examples um, of that today. I covered most of, of what's on that slide already. Um, these three points are the requirements we came up with for uh, finally accepting Phoenix and to Boost. That's the unification of the functional libraries uh, using of Boost Proto for unified placeholders and cross-library integration. And one point which was raised in 2008 was that it would be nice to use C++11 features or C++ uh, OX features in Phoenix, but this one has not been uh, implemented yet. But as far as I know, Thomas is actually working on it. W one major point which was uh, raised was we have to improve and document the extension mechanism for people to do something useful with Phoenix in the end. So, okay, what's Phoenix really? Um, Phoenix enables functional programming techniques in C++. And as you will see during the talk today, um, everything you know about C++ is still true, but everything is different because Phoenix is all about function objects. And everything you see in Phoenix is a function object. Um, certainly you can use global functions for that as well, but Phoenix itself deals with callable entities only and usually we just use function objects for that. Um, it's about higher order functions, lambdas, um, currying, so partial function application or the boost facility is called bind. Um, later on, during the development of the new Phoenix, we actually realized, hey, it's not only about functional programming, it's about creating an embedded domain-specific language in C++ which models C++ itself in C++. And we will see a couple of examples uh, what I mean uh, by that uh, in, in during that talk. Uh, while it's uh, very much oriented toward functions and to deal with functions and function objects, it's not uh, functional programming in the pure sense, like the Haskell community is doing it, but it's more focused on usefulness and practicality, and we 
we are cutting corners in purity or certain eleg elegance or strict adherence to, to FP functional programming principles. Um, that last point is very important, I believe, because <clears throat> while we, we bring the power of functional programming, programming to C++, we are still able to integrate our functional programs very nicely with the usual imperative style of programming and you can share data between the imper imperative part of the program and, and your functional part. But we all know that's actually the power of C++ and that's why we are doing that. Okay, what's the motivation? I hope they don't mind if I drink from a bottle so I'm not threatened to spill anything. Okay, so that's the, the motivation, where everything comes from. And everybody probably knows that example from, from different um, publications or from, from different talks. You have a std accumulate and you have some container, some standard com conforming container, and you want to accumulate all values inside that container and want to add up let's say it's a container of integers and we want to add up all the integers in that container and uh, the easiest way to do that is just to use the std plus um, predefined function objects to do that. Um, Phoenix is just the next evolutionary step uh, to that by replacing the std plus by some almost naturally looking C++ expression and in that case, many of you might know that already or have seen very similar things in the, in the Lambda library. Uh, by introducing placeholders, arg1 and arg2, in, in, in boost, in bind, and in, in other boost libraries, um, they are usually called underscore one, underscore two, and Phoenix supports those underscore notations as well. But I'll, I'll stick to arg1 and arg2 during this talk. Well, um, to understand what's going on, you have to remember that accumulate calls the supplied function object or the supplied uh, function with two arguments. The first argument is a current um, accumulated value and the second argument is the value of the current element uh, you are iterating over. And whatever that function is doing, it has to return the new value of the accumulated value. And if you um, iterate over all elements of your container, in the end you get the sum of all elements. And in that way, arg1 refers to the first argument of that function, which is being called, and arg2 arc refers to the second argument of that function, which is being called. So arg1 is the current value in that context the current accumulated value and arc2 is a new value I want to add to. So I just add the two arguments and I, the result of that expression is returned to the accumulate algorithm and is used for the, for the next iteration. Question? Yes? Could you have used a plus equal? You could have, but it wouldn't make any sense. Because as you remember, the standard algorithms are copying are calling the function objects by value. So the current value of the accumulate the current accumulated value gets copied into that function object. So even if you use plus equals, it will locally compute the result properly, but it's it will it won't modify arc one directly as long as you don't use explicit references as we will see in, in on the next slides. Make sense? Yes? I think what he meant was why didn't you just, instead of R, R1 plus R2, you could write init plus equals R2, but then you don't, you don't need to accumulate, you can just do for each. Yes, I mean, you can do examples in any way you want. I, I just wanted to have a motivating example just to, to show something. Okay, so, and here, that's the point where that notion of C++ and C++ comes into play, because what Phoenix is doing, it provides you all the power of C++, all the, al uh, all, all the algorithms, all the operators, um, everything C++ can give you, but not in a direct sense as you are using it in, in normal expressions, but in the sense of function objects, and we will see how that works. And I'll give you a couple of examples of all the features Phoenix is providing you with on the next slides.
Let's start very simple. Yeah, everything is a function object. Let's start very simple with values and references. Phoenix has a predefined uh, construct which is called val. And val is initialized from a, from a value and all it's doing, it encapsulates that value in a way that when you invoke that function object which is returned by a val 42, additionally invoking, it returns that 42. So that expression will print 42 actually. It works for uh, variables as well. Uh, the second example does the same thing um, except that it captures its argument not by value but it captures its argument by, by reference. So in that case ref is returning a function object which encapsulates a reference to i and when I invoke that function object, when I call the overloaded function operator, one second, on that, uh, it will return the reference to i. So in that case, since i is 42, it will print 42 as well. Yes? Oh, in the case of val, if you pass it uh, a variable, it would make a copy of that. Right. And you will see in, in a minute how that might be implemented in a very simple way, just to give you an idea. Yeah, here we go. That's pseudocode and please remember all the code I'm showing today on those slides uh, you don't you can't copy it and, and compile it because I left out uh, certain uh, boilerplate things which are not interesting in the context of that talk but all of the examples you will find on in the Phoenix um, examples directory in SVN and you really can compile them and you can can look at them what I want to show here is how you could naively implement a vowel in yourself and that's absolutely not how it's done in Phoenix but I want to show you anyway how, how you could implement it just to give you an idea how these function objects are created and, and what, what's going on behind the scenes. So what you have here is a val function that's here which takes an arbitrary template argument t, in our case it was an integer, and val is a function which returns a instance of a struct which holds t by value and which has a function operator which when invoked returns t to the user. And that's the whole trick there. Um, if you, let's go back to the, to the previous slide just to give you an idea. We have val. val42 returns an instance of a struct and that struct has a function operator and when I invoke it, when I call, use that function object as a callable, it will invoke that function operator which in turn will return 42 to you. <coughs> um, I just left, uh, because of pseudocode, I just left it out. Um, and you will see, we will see that Phoenix, the, the function object generated by Phoenix are polymorphic and variadic. And that's why I just left it out, because we don't need it in that context. That's, please don't uh, take that verbatim. It's really just to show you how, how the, the structure is built. <coughs> um, that shows you the same thing for ref. The difference here is that everything is taken by reference. The re oh, sorry. The so reference function takes its argument by reference, returns a ref impl uh, struct instance of a ref impl struct which holds its value it got in, uh, initialized from by, by reference and its function operator returns that reference to the user and in that case it gives us the i which resolves to 42 as, as we saw in the previous example. Um, that's very important to understand because that's the crux of Phoenix. All what Phoenix is doing all the time it generates these function objects for you on the fly and all these function objects have an overloaded operator, function operator, when invoked, does something for you. Does it make sense? Good. Okay. May I ask? Yes? Return t is return value. Return t is what? Yeah, that was return type is, is reference, right? Yeah, that's a reference and that's a value. They say the operator, he should be returning value, not t. Return value semicolon. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, that's a typo, it should return a value, yeah, you're right. Um, I missed that, and, and uh, we, we bounced it back and forth with, with Thomas Heller, uh, I don't know, 100 times, but you know, how these things work. <laughs> I will change that suddenly before we upload that to, to the code. Okay, let's get to the placeholders. And placeholders are, have it, some kind of magic, right? They refer to something you don't see. But the implementation of placeholders is very, very simple, and we will see how that works. In the simplest case, a arg1 is a placeholder, and in this case, it's not a function, but it's an instance of a function object. So Phoenix predefines an instance of a certain function object, which, when invoked, just returns whatever it has been invoked with. So arg1 returns the first argument it has been invoked with. Okay, um, arg1, in that case as well, returns just its first argument when it's being invoked. Arg2 would return the second argument it, is invoked, uh, it has been invoked with. As I already mentioned, uh, Phoenix supports the alternative placeholder names, uh, which are uh, usually used in Boost and uh, on the standard now as well. So arg1 is completely equivalent to underscore 1, arg2 is completely equivalent to underscore 2, and so on. So these placeholder function objects, they're uh, existing on stack or static variables? or They usually, <laughs> that's a very tricky question. Um, I, they usually exist on, on a stack and are passed by reference, <coughs> but they are not exist in the sense as I show it on those slides because they disguised as proto trees, and we will see how that works in a minute. That's really just to give you an idea how these things are implemented. Okay, let's have a look how we could implement arg1, for instance. Um, we have a struct arg1 impl, which has nothing more than a function operator returning its corresponding argument it stands for. So arg1 returns its first argument. arg2 returns the second argument of that function invocation. And arg1 itself is just a predefined instance, predefined instance of that arg1 impl struct. Um, so when you, you can use arg1 and invoke it, because the, the corresponding type has an overloaded function operator, and it will return the first argument it has been invoked with. That's all what, uh, what placeholders are doing. And um, I was for a long time wondering how? What, what the hell is going on there? It's really like magic. But if you look at the code and if you think about it, it's so straightforward and so easy to understand. <coughs> um, Phoenix provides you with operators. Um, it's the same way as you can work with um, values and references and these placeholders, you can combine all of the Phoenix expressions uh, with the operators, as done in that case with, with the multiplier. And uh, as you already might guess, that the result of that expression, arg1 times arg2, creates another function object, which when invoked with a set of parameters, will just do what you expect it to do. It will multiply the, two, the, um, the second argument and the first argument, in that case 6. Or another, argument, uh, another more complicated example. Let's say we have two variables, x and z, x is 3 and z is 5, and we want to assign a new value to x, that's why we wrap it up in a reference, and on the right hand side we want to combine or want to add the first argument the whole thing is invoked with, which is a 4 in that case, with the current value of z, where z is taken by reference. So what we get is 4 plus 5, so the whole thing will print 9. Again, that construct, which is, uh, consists out of several Phoenix terms, are just combined and in the end give you another Phoenix expression, which has that overloaded function operator, when, which when invoked with a certain uh, set of parameters will do just the right thing for you underneath. That's what I mean with C++ in C++, because we model C++ semantics using function objects. <coughs> but so far you've shown on the expressions. Sure. Can you do more than expressions? <laughs> uh, 
be patient. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to get it a bit slowly in the beginning because I know that some people sitting in here never had any exposure to, to Phoenix. I just want to convey the idea what, what Phoenix is doing before we really dig into the deep stuff where everybody can just relax, sit back and say, oh yeah, that might be interesting. I'm not interested in that. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm listening anyway, right? So I want to convey that idea first. Um, yet another example. This time with three placeholders, uh, arg1 equals arg2 plus something. And this time we bind x as a argument inside a reference. That's the usual boost ref here. So that you can just use any Phoenix ref or you could use boost ref here. That works because you just uh, bind by reference. And uh, that's why we are getting the result back, because that is, is bound by a reference, right? Argument 1 is a reference to x, argument 2 is 3, and argument 3 is 4. So in the end we get 15 if we, if we execute that code. Um, let's have a look at some pseudocode, uh, how these upper Yes? Why is, you said that could be boost ref. Why is that not ambiguous to know whether it's the Phoenix ref or the boost ref? Oh, you have to disambiguate it yourself. It's pseudocode. Okay. <laughs> it's a good excuse, right? Yeah. I can make any any errors on the slides. It's, it's always pseudocode. And <laughs> my, my point is really that I want to convey the idea, right? And, and not not the the the. Uh, I'm not claiming that that code really will compile, as I said in the beginning. Just look at the examples; you will find all that stuff there. Uh, just another question. Yes. What would happen if you put a val instead of a ref before the x? Nothing. Uh, X wouldn't wouldn't be altered because you <laughs> copy X, and the would copy. It be three or would it be it, nine? It would be three because you still have. I mean, you're assigning the result to whatever is here, but you're assigning to the copy of of your X, which is inside the well. Okay. And that's why the result would be three because we initialized it to three first. Okay. The the outer X would be unchanged. That's the answer. Yes. Do you need a parenthesis around uh, multiplication? Uh, no, I just put it there for brevity. You don't need that. So that wouldn't generate an error that you're assigning to something that's not a reference. It just wouldn't do what you expect. It would just do whatever you wrote, which is probably not what you expect. I think if you wrote bell x there, it would fail to compile. Might be. I, I never tried it. I might be. No, it, it well, let's try it out afterwards, yeah. I, I'm just seeing, I'm not seeing it right now. Okay, some pseudocode how these operators, how you can think of these operators to be implemented. The trick is that you have an overloaded operator plus, and that example does it for plus, which takes two function objects. Remember, when we do a plus in Phoenix, we have arg1 plus arg2. Arg1 and arg2 are function objects. So I have to overload and again, that's simplified because that probably will create ambiguities with all other kind of stuff. So think F1 and F2 as being constrained to, func uh, to Phoenix expressions. So that operator will be instantiated only if you pass two Phoenix expressions here. And what it does, it wraps up these two Phoenix function objects inside a plus impl function object, which is defined here. Just holds these function objects by value. And when the operator is invoked, the function operator is invoked, the interesting thing happens. You might think, okay, it would just add these, the results of the, two, of the invocation of these two function objects. But what's interesting is that these function objects are invoked with all arguments which have been passed here. Because one of those might be arg2 and the other one might, might be arg3. And arg2 wants to return its second argument and arg3 wants to return its third argument. So what happens here is that all arguments you are... Um, for instance here, you're passing to your whole expression, are passed along to all sub-expressions when they are evaluated. So arg1 is evaluated by passing all three arguments to it, and arg2 is evaluated by passing all three arguments to it, and arg3 is evaluated the same way. And that's what I said in the beginning. Function objects and Phoenix are fully variadic. So you can invoke them with as many arguments you want, but they will pick and choose those arguments you actually need. And you can invoke them with more arguments than the expression actually needs. I, I, I could just pass a, a fourth and fifth and sixth argument here, but they wouldn't be used in any way. 
So Phoenix expressions are fully variadic. And as you already saw, they are fully polymorphic in the sense that I can pass any types I want as the arguments. I don't have to pre-specify what types I want to use there. <coughs> okay, operators. As you might think and might know or might guess already, uh, Phoenix gives you all operators uh, C++ have. Has. So it, it gives you all the un unary pre uh, prefix operators, the unary postfix operators, all the binary operators. And since we can't overload the turn ternary uh, question mark colon thing, it provides you with a construct which is exposing the same semantics as the question mark colon thing. Um, it's just called if else and has the same semantics. And that's mainly because we can't overload that operator. We have to talk to, to Dave. Dave, <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need an overload for question mark colon operator. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right, write a proposal, right? Uh, right? That's the usual answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, what? I'm not going to say it. You know the answer. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, Dave, I'm, I'm here on a stage. When you're on a stage, you have to entertain people. So, you know, I have to, have to play, play that game with you. <laughs> okay, now your answer. Statements. Can I have statements in Phoenix? And yes, you can have statements. It has a couple of predefined things like if else. It has a if underscore, for instance, which allows you to build um, conditional expressions. And this syntax generally is the way that everything where you expect curly braces in normal code, since we can't overload curly braces, Phoenix is using the indexing operator and overloads that instead of uh, the, the body of, of some statement. So wherever you would, put, would like to put the curly braces in Phoenix, you have to, have to use the the uh, square brackets, uh, which stand for execute that block of code whenever the condition is true. And in that case, whenever the first argument is larger than 5, the first argument is 6, execute that, so the whole thing will print 6. And if I passed a 3 here, the whole thing wouldn't print anything. Okay? Um, a more realistic example, perhaps, uh, a vector of a couple of, of uh, values of integers, 4, 5, and 6, and we want to print only those integers which are larger than 5. You can do that easily by creating a function object which is testing for whether the argument is larger than 5. And remember, since we are using for each, for each, one second, for each invokes its function object with one argument, which is the one pointing to the current element it's iterating over, and arc1 refers to that first argument which is getting passed, and if that first argument is larger than 5, we will print it, and otherwise we won't. You might say I forgot the comma in the end, but you, you get the idea. Yes? On the first example of CL, why do you have CL and then CL again? Do you need the first CL? Which one? The other one. Ah, uh, that's a very good question. I don't need that. You're right. It's another error. That that whole thing is sufficient. I, I don't need that CL. You're right. Yes. Other questions? Yes? So I see you using a standard CL in the square yes. and then argument one, which is a Phoenix yes. thing. Uh, but you know, okay, uh, if I want to print out, say, telephone number, I print out okay, a string, my telephone number, colon, and then actual string. Yes. <coughs> what I'm getting at is the first two op operands for the, the left, left, left shift operator yeah. are not Phoenix hmm. entities. Yes. Would that, that be okay? Or it's an excellent question, and the, the answer is twofold. A, Phoenix knows about std C out. So it automatically wraps stitz out into a ref to stitz out. And it knows about these streaming operators. That's just to simplify the code so you, that you don't have to wrap that into a, a reference yourself. So that's some specific code which is in Phoenix which knows about stitz out. The other uh, thing is, and we will see it in a minute, um, certainly you have to tell the compiler that this whole thing is a Phoenix expression. And if the expression is, consists out of three terms, and the first two terms are normal expressions, which are not Phoenix expressions. So the compiler will evaluate the first two terms in a normal manner and not in a Phoenix sense. And we will see an example how you can work around that. 
Yes. I see there's no semicolon at the end of your C outline. What if you need to write two lines? Just use comma. You can overload the comma operator, and Phoenix is doing that. So instead of um, using semicolons, when you have a sequence of, of things you want to execute inside, sorry, inside that block, you just separate them by comma, and they will execute it in sequence. Um, partial function application. Uh, probably everybody knows boost bind. And the, the semantics are exactly the same. Phoenix provides you with a predefined construct called bind, uh, which you can use in the same way as you used um, boost bind. Um, and you can invoke it with, with uh, arbitrary number of arguments. And in that case, we are binding the first argument. Or let me put it this way. Bind the first part of that expression returns a function object which, when invoked, will resolve the, all the arguments and then in, will invoke foo with the arguments. So foo will be invoked with the value of i, which is, so x will be 4 and y will be 3. So the whole thing will print 7. That's 100% the same as you are used to from, from uh, boost bind. Uh, I, I just skim over other things uh, Phoenix provides you with. In case you want to construct something explicitly in a Phoenix expression, you can use construct, you can allocate a new string, you can delete a string, you can statically, dynamically cast things, you can even raise, uh, throw exceptions, you can catch, catch exceptions. So you can do everything what you can do in C++ inside a Phoenix generated function object in the same way as you're used to in, in, in doing it in, in straight code, but as its incarnation as a function object. Yes? Does Phoenix have a, a syntax for placement new? Right? <coughs> well, it probably. No. No, the answer is no. The answer is no. But that's a very good, good remark. Yeah, it might be useful to add that. Yes? Uh, sorry, the question was if there's support for placement new. And you're right, there is no, no placement new. Yes? How do you construct scopes? Scopes? So, um, if you have an if underscore, you can use square braces yeah. to get whatever you want. But if you want to have scopes inside them, mm -hmm. uh, you say a equals 3 comma square braces, I didn't plan to go into that during that talk. Phoenix gives you unnamed function objects which uh, using a predefined construct lambda and that lambda can have additional local variables which you define using let. So you can create scopes and you even can create local variables inside those scopes and refer to them from, from the outside. But I just didn't want to go into, into every detail here. Please refer to this documentation, you will find all those details. Um, another thing is how to adapt arbitrary functions. And uh, let's look at how we could implement factorial. So let's say we have a function object which gets generated when invoked with one argument. And when you invoke that function object, it returns the, the uh, whatever that function is doing. In that case, it's a factorial function, so it returns 20, 24. Or if you use that same factorial function, and I will show you how that's implemented in, in, on the next slide, and if you invoke that factorial function inside a context where it will be invoked by for each, right, the second pair of parentheses, which you can imagine here, are um, generated by for each, and for each is passing all the elements, um, of that of that sequence one by one. So in that case, it will print the factorials of the elements of the of the uh, container you you passed in. How it's implemented? Well, the easy part is to implement the factorial itself. It's a function operator, as you might expect, which takes one argument, which is our number we want to raise to the factorial, and we just use the, the uh, recursive algorithm to calculate that factorial. But that alone doesn't allow you to integrate that with Phoenix. So what you need, in addition, is 
a mechanism to tell Phoenix what uh, the, the, all the information it needs to know about the return type of that expression. So what is the type of that expression? And as you might know, C++, um, at least O3, doesn't give you any any mechanism to detect or to to defer uh, to no defer is the wrong word what what I'm looking at deduce to deduce the return type of a function object what will be the type um, of a when I invoke that function of the object with that set of uh, with that set of types um, and uh, the usual way this is done is using the so-called uh, result of protocol which is essentially a embedded template you are defining which gets invoked with the type itself. I'll, I'll say a word about that strange syntax here. But think about it as the question, hey, what will be the result of fact impl when I invoke it with one argument of type arg? And the answer is, it will be arg. So the answer is the embedded type def type inside the template, which has to be called result inside fact impl. So that's the normal uh, way um, code is being written nowadays uh, when it has to support the result of protocol. Uh, a word about that syntax and you might think that's a function invocation. It is not. It is the type of a function returning this and taking one argument. Um, and <coughs> to be honest there is nothing related to a function description here. The result of protocol just abuses that uh, way of writing things. C++ allows you to write it here. And what it means is, really, what is the result of invoking this with that argument? And you have to embed that um, type def type. So don't mix that with any function invocation. It's really just for convenience. It is done so that it um, somehow gives you the, the visual impression of a function invocation. But in reality, the, the actual meaning of that construct is something completely different because it's a, uh, not the invocation of this, but this is the return type and that is the, the argument. Um, might be confusing, but please read up on the, on the result of protocol. You, you will find that information. Uh, what Phoenix is providing you with is a predefined template called function which when instantiated with that function object we defined gives you that fact function we can use in that way as we had it in that example. Uh, yes? Can I ask a question? Uh, so um, you can do the same thing with a lambda function, right? Yeah, you could get so the same thing with lambda. Can you maybe point out why would you do things or what's the advantage? Or uh, give give me give me two more slides and I'll give you give you the answer to that. Okay. Here we go. See, <laughs> <laughs> I talked to him before when I had slide 23. Please ask that question. And now he asked that question. Now you can I can give you the answer. Um, uh, what what's the difference between Phoenix and Lambda? And why do we want to use Phoenix? And why do we want to use Lambda? And if you look at the at the um, properties of those two constructs, um, you will see that Lambdas have the have the um, ad advantage of being built-in language constructs. They have no significant t compile time overhead because the compiler is specifically optimized to do that. But they have the disadvantage that um, they construct monomorphic function objects, so you have to specify the types of your lambdas in place. Whenever you write a lambda, you specify what types that lambda is able to take. A and B, they are not variadic. So you have to specify the number of arguments you actually want to pass to that lambda. Well, except if you use uh, ellipsis, but that's, that's a different can of worms. Um, and for normal code, whenever you have just a four for each and you want to, to put some, some simple expression in there or simple lambda, then lambda is probably the, the way to go. But in generic programming, you often don't know the types of your, of your arguments that function object will be invoked, right? Um, and on the other hand, why do I have to spell out that the argument is an integer when I put it into a for each which iterates over a vector of integers? Why the hell do I have to do that? Um, the other thing, if I write an algorithm which 
uh, takes arbitrary containers and I want to iterate over all these containers, I want to invoke some function object, I might not know what the type is the container actually holds, right? It might be integer, it might be long, it might be double. And in that case I can't use a lambda because lambdas are monomorphic. I have to specify the type of the argument whenever I define the lambda. And there Phoenix shines because there you don't have to do that. It's polymorphic. It doesn't care what types it's being invoked with. And it's variadic, so you can invoke it with as many arguments you want. Okay? Does it answer your question? Yes? So you were saying uh, single space lambda and lambdas. Uh, if I have a lambda inside a template functional class, I cannot use just t as a parameter? Inside a functional class, you might be able to do that, certainly. But um, in a simple for each case, you can't do that. I mean, you have just a for each, and you pass in some containers. How do you want to deduce that, that, that type inside the container? It doesn't work. On the other hand, library, uh, Phoenix is a library, which is a good thing. Uh, expressions are placed directly in code, uh, which you... Oh, so I, I'm not able to, to handle that thing. Um, uh, whereas in Lambda, you have to ha wrap it up in that special construct. You have still have to write lambda, parameters, and so on. In, in Phoenix, you just place directly in code polymorphic and variadic function objects. But certainly there's a disadvantage. You create additional compile time overhead if compared to lambdas. So as always in life, you have to make the decision what, what do you want and what feature is really useful for you. Other questions? Yes? Mm, it really depends on the compiler. If the compiler is smart enough, it can optimize away everything. And in the end, you end up with 100% the same code. But most compilers, I have to admit, are not as smart in that regard. But I really hope that, that the compiler vendors will catch up on that as well. Especially now that our lambdas are widely used, so there, there will be some additional optimizations compilers have to, have to implement anyway. Okay, let's have two more examples, just for the, for the sake of it, so that you can, can get a, a, more fe a better feeling uh, uh, for that whole thing. What I'm doing in that example is, I'm creating a print function which takes a function object, and all that print function is, it prints the result of invoking that function object it has been invoked with. If I print from with val3, it certainly will print 3. If I print val hello world, it will print hello world. Because it gets past a function object which gets invoked here. And that's the crux in Phoenix. You, you kind of split off the creation of the function object, which happens in one place, from the invocation of the function object, which happens in a completely different place. That's exac exactly what's happening in functional programming all the time, right? You create a function in one place, pass it around, and somewhere else you invoke it with a completely um, independent set of arguments. Another example. Uh, let's again uh, use some standard algorithm, in that case find if. And what this small program is doing, it returns uh, the iterator to the first argument which matches that predicate. And the predicate is, uh, please return the first odd number in my list. And it will return the iterator to the five. Again, find if invokes its function object, it gets passed in with one argument, which is the current element it's iterating over. So arg1 refers to that argument it, the, the function object gets invoked with. In that case, it's 2, 10, 4, 5, and so on. And by evaluating these, this expression, we get, just get whether it's odd or not, whether it's even or not. And if it's odd, we find if we'll just stop iterating and we'll return the iterator to that element it found. And when we dereference that iterator, we will print 5. OK. Any questions? Yes? Uh, in the previous slide, you said it was polymorphic. Is this what you're referring to, that it's generic? <coughs> polymorphic, yes. Uh, yes. actually polymorphic with dynamic dispatch? No, no. It's, uh, uh, compile time polymorphism. So you can pass any type you want, but the compiler will adapt or will generate the proper code for th this set of types you, you pass in that current uh, invocation. So it's not dynamically uh, runtime dispatched, it's, it's pure compile time polymorphism. Okay, 
So far, that's the end of the first half of the talk where I just wanted to give you an introduction into the gener general features of, of, that, of that library. What I'm going to do from that point on, essentially I'm, I'm just going to present a couple of more complex um, examples showing you different facets of the library just to give an idea, you an idea what you can do with that library and how you can extend that library for your own needs. And the first example I'm, I'm going to present is a minimal ACO echo server. Um, if you attended that talk this morning, um, Christopher told you that ACO is usually used in a very asynchronous, asynchronous manner. And that asynchrony um, happens the following way. You invoke a, a action, a asynchronous action, and accept, for instance, I want to accept a network incoming network connection and with invoking that accept you pass along a function which has to be invoked after the accept operation is finished. Um, and you do that with all the operations in ACO. You have a, um, mm, a accept state, you have a state where you wait for write to finish, you have a state where you wait for the read to finish and so on. In the end, you can present that as a state machine. Um, if you think of how an um, echo server should work, you have some start state where things are, are being started. Then you switch your program into a mode where you wait for an incoming connection, where you wait for an accept. And after you accepted that connection, you switch to a new state, which means reading. So you wait for some incoming data. And after that data has, been, has arrived, you switch to writing mode because you just want to echo the data you got. You send it back to the, to the uh, sender. And after you wrote your data, you again go back to reading and you do that as long as uh, everything is okay. And as soon as some of those operations fail, you just go back to accepting mode in a very simple state machine manner. Um, ASIO is uh, doing that with handlers. So along with, with your state, you pass a function which ASIO will invoke after that state has been successfully reached or when an error in that state happened. Um, you start off with calling uh, ACO accept, which moves into accepting state. And when the accept has been, or when, when an incoming ex uh, connection has been accepted, the accept handler is called which will switch into reading mode and when some data has been read the read handler will be called which will switch into writing mode. The writing mode initially it's the writing and when the writing has been finished the write handler has been call, uh, will be called and so on and so on. So it's really some interactive thing where you just provide the functions to ASIO and ASIO notifies you when a certain action has been, <coughs> has been completed. So let's see how we can implement that simple um, state machine, that simple ACO server with, with Phoenix. Uh, what we see here is a macro which defi is defined by Phoenix, boost Phoenix adapt, adapt function, and that macro adapts arbitrary global functions for you. So if you have a function which is global, you can make it into a Phoenix function object by using that macro. And uh, since we have uh, to invoke um, three functions on on the on the ACO API, we have we want to wrap ACO async read, which starts a read operation. We want to wrap ACO async write, which starts a write operation, and we want to wrap uh, ACO mutable buffers. No, ACO buffer, which uh, wraps the data uh, we want to we we receive and and we we want to send. Uh, that expression means that I'm creating a new function object, Phoenix function object, which is called read, wrapping that global function, and that global function expects to get three arguments, and it's returning void. Write the same. It wraps async write, which expects to get three arguments, and returns void. And the buffer function takes two arguments, the corresponding Phoenix function object will be called buffer and that's a return value of, of ACO buffer. So it's a very simple way uh, to wrap um, arbitrary global functions and allow to integrate them into your Phoenix expressions. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering like how it handled like for the argument count. If yes. If you had like default uh, parameters or like if you had 
like a partial evaluation already or something? Don't make it too complicated on me. <laughs> um, you can have arbitrary overloads of that thing. All you have to do is to write several of those macros with several arguments counts. So default arguments is a bit problematic. But um, just think about, or, or how can I explain that? Um, for instance, that write function, that write function object is a polymorphic Phoenix object. It accepts arbitrary number of arguments. And if I wrap a function which itself can resolve to several overloads, the proper overload will be chosen in the proper context, wherever you, you call it with, with a different number of arguments. You see what I mean? So it's, it's like always in template programming. The compiler in the end will figure it out, what function to call, what types to use, and so on. And if you have several overloads for async write, it will choose the, the proper one. Um, the last one is the accept function, and since ACO doesn't have a predefined accept um, handler, what, I, what I'm doing here, um, I'm writing my own, which wraps the async accept, and I have to wrap that because I don't have, um, async accept is not a global function, ACO, but it's a member function of the acceptor, and we will see where that come into play. So all I'm doing, I'm, I'm wrapping that member function call into an explicit global function, where the first argument is the object I want to invoke it on, and the others are the arguments I want to pass. And then I bind that global function, accept impl, to the Phoenix object accept, and in that case, I have to specify three arguments because I get one, two, three arguments where the first is the accept itself. And we will see how that gets invoked. So you even can adapt functions which are not global functions, uh, but you have to add some boilerplate yourself. Okay, now let's tie that together and you will see that it um, make, uh, will make sense in a minute. What's missing is our read handlers, our, our handler functions, we have to define where the actual logic happens, where we invoke the ACO functionality, where we specify what to in what new state to get, what, what handlers to set. And let's just assume that our read handler is a boost function which takes two arguments. And that's the uh, prototype ACO is expecting for all read handlers. So ACO will invoke that function for us whenever the read operation has been finished. Same for the write handler and the accept handler. Um, ACO will call it with only the error code. Um, so you, you will, can analyze whether, whether the operation was successful or not. Okay, let's tie it together. Let's start with the accept handler. Um, the accept handler, just to remind you, will be called by ACO when a connection was accepted or when it was refused. So we define our accept handler, which is a function object, uh, is a boost function, and the code which has to uh, is is um, represented by the accept handler is a Phoenix function object. So if no error happened, so underscore one stands for the argument it got invoked with. If no error happened uh, and accept handler is invoked, that means we got an, a, a um, connection accepted and we want to read data. So what we do, we invoke the read function we defined, it's our bound Phoenix object. We pass some global socket we have, that's really just the ACO socket, you will see the code in a minute. We pass a buffer where we want to put the data in, uh, we read, and that's the read handler gets passed as a third argument. That means whenever that read operation is finished, please call that function. So if something happened during accepting, so if some error happened, we go into the else case, which goes back into the accept mode just by accepting a new, new connection. Um, one interesting nitpick you might see here, we have an if underscore square brackets, that's what we already saw, and now we want to add a else case to it, but the only way to do that in, in that context is to use a dot notation, because we can't just write else here, the compiler wouldn't make any sense of that. So that if object has a member which is called else, which is a function object, which when, and, and, and so on. So the, the whole thing plays out there again. Um, 
it's really the constraint of, of the syntax we have to work with. I mean, we can't trick. Speaking of constraints, it's Alice underscore. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. See, you guys, you. I, I will correct all those errors, so I, I apologize for the errors. On the other hand, I always can claim I, uh, claim I put everything, the errors, in there just to keep you awake and then to <laughs> see if you're still, still uh, with me. A pseudocode, okay. But then, then I should have left that underscore out here. <laughs> okay. Um, if you look at um, the read handler, the read handler gets invoked by ACO with two arguments. The first is the error code, the second is the number of bytes we actually, ACO has been reading. And same structure. If everything is okay, we switch into write mode. We want to write the data we got in the buffer. And the second argument refers to the number of elements we want to read, uh, want to write back to the to the uh, receiver. Yes. Uh, is there a specific reason why write handler is wrapped in PHX ref? Is it just? Ooh. Phoenix namespace short. Yes, uh, I, I should have put a Phoenix ref here as well. And there? Yeah, and there, and there, and there. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, I apologize for the inconsistency. Uh, it's not wrong, it's just the Phoenix ref is, is the only place I'm using that's qualification. What's wrong is the double reference on the function <coughs> signature. That's definitely wrong as well. That's uh, not even a R value reference here. So that should be one. Yeah, but you can go back several slides. The yeah. Phoenix ref should have been on there. Yeah, but we had it on the first slide, right? Ref. One. On the first slide, second slide was a ref. I introduced oh. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's um, totals all the way down. Yeah. So you you see it's it's the same semantics and the same constructs which are used over and over again. And once and last but not least, the right handler has the same error here and has the same error here because I copied and pasted the code. You see it. It's um, uh, a lot of uh, inconsistencies here. But I, I, I trust you get the idea. Whenever a write operation has been finished, if you remember our state diagram, we want to initiate the next read operation, which will call the read handler after it finished, which will bring us back into the write mode and so on. And if something goes wrong, we go back into accept mode. So in this example, can you explain why this would be possible with lambdas? Uh, that is certainly possible with lambda. You could could do that with lambdas. But what I wanted to show is a how you bind global functions with Phoenix because sometimes you want to bind them, and b how you can just build use this kind of things and and so on. Certainly with lambdas you could do the same thing. And uh, Christopher probably will tell you, hey, why why don't you do it with lambdas? It's a lot easier. Okay, please bear with me. It's an example. Okay, yes. So this. Else class is pretty much the same for all three right. handlers. Right. And uh, in order to not repeat code, right. like to put it in a separate variable, can you do it without auto? Uh, what you can do is you can wrap the whole thing in a lambda and invoke the lambda, but then you have to. I, I didn't want to go into that uh, uh, complexity. And you will, right? Uh, you can look at the SVN in the example directory. There's two way, uh, two ACO echo servers, and one actually is using that technique to reduce the code. And if you look a bit more closely, the right handler and the read handler are completely equivalent, except for for the the handler they are invoking. So these two can be wrapped into one lambda as well. But then things get really a bit complicated and I didn't want to. Uh, it's really just to show you what you can do with it. Um, I'm not claiming that's the most efficient way or the most interesting way to do that. But I, I, I trusted that ASIO is something almost everybody can, can understand and can follow. So that, that was just an example. I'm passing a reference to a right handler. Yeah. Can I write some Phoenix code in that spot, which in turn says if not underscore one, take some other action. Yes, you can. Sure, certainly, you could wrap that up into a lambda function and invoke that lambda function so there. I mean, so I could create an, an arbitrary sequence of operations, say to log into a mail server yeah. as one big thing. Sure, definitely. Or just write a global function and wrap everything up and then put that global function in there, wrapped up as a Phoenix function. So whatever Phoenix expression you come up with, you can put there. 
So it's not constrained to that particular example. It's, it's just the most simple example I, I was able, or Thomas was able to, to come up with in that context. Sorry, sorry follow-up question there. When I write underscore one, yes. in that nested bit, which one does it refer to? In that case, it's clear, right? Because we have only one scope, and that underscore one will refer to that, that argument, and underscore two will refer to the argument, uh, second argument it got on log with. But if you have a lambda, then things get really complicated, because you have several scopes of, of and then you probably want to use let to define local variables, which refer to the outer arguments, and uh, then you refer to the inner arguments inside the lambda function itself. It gets really, really complicated. And uh, please look at the SVN. There's an example in there how, how you can do that. Write one's code. Write one's code. I mean, once you wrote it, it's not difficult to understand. And as in C++, usually once it works, you don't want to touch it because it just works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Perl po 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 is right only. That's the difference. <laughs> okay, other questions? Yes? Um, I'm having, do you have a slide that shows how the square bracket works? Uh, yes, later on. Um, that's the, just the glue code you're using to invoke that thing. And uh, Christopher, please correct me if I got it wrong again. So what you do, you just create an I.O. service. You create the, create the acceptor, the one which ex is accepting the messages with some endpoint. You create that socket. And then you invoke the first async accept outside of Phoenix. And then the whole uh, state machine starts working and starts churning. And you don't have to go back to the, to the plain ACO code anymore. OK. That's just for information. Any questions? No? OK. That's kind of a, a point uh, in the talk where I expect that some of you will start uh, not being as interested anymore. Because what I'm going to do from that point on is to explain some of the um, inner intricacies of interplay of Proto and Phoenix, which might be difficult to, to explain for me in, in, in the limited um, amount of time I have available. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, and I, I, I'm, or we might, might afterwards just get, get together somewhere. Um, as I already mentioned, uh, Phoenix is built, Phoenix version 3 is built on top of Boost Proto. Uh, you all probably heard about Boost, Boost Proto, um, and I want to give you an executive, ex executive um, overview about Proto in three minutes or four slides. And um, uh, thank God Eric is not here because he would probably just kill me if I do that in, in, in three slides. As I mentioned in the beginning, please go to the talks of jo uh, Joel Falku will, will give oh, over that week. Uh, there will you get all the information you want to know or don't even want to know about uh, Proto. But a short overview uh, to give you the context where that, that whole uh, thing lives in. The facilities of Proto are used to form the back end of Phoenix. And actually, um, Proto has specifically gained additional um, functionality just to support Phoenix, and that's a good thing. Generally, Proto allows you to create expression template classes and its composition. And we will see a couple of examples what I mean by that. And the second thing what it's helping to do is you can formulate your transformations of that expression tree into a different expression tree, which allows to do whatever you want to do uh, um, in, in that code. So it provides you with the facilities to generate your abstract, abstract syntax tree. Um, and I will give you a couple of examples in, on the next slides what I mean with that. Essentially what Proto is doing, when it sees a C++ expression, which um, can be interpreted as a Proto expression, it will generate a Proto expression, that's the type name, where Proto expression is a template, which is a hierarchical type representing the expression it has been generated from. As I said, I'll give you an example in a minute. That's one thing Proto is doing. 
Second thing, Proto allows you to describe the language, the, the allowed expressions in terms of a grammar very much like uh, Spirit is doing that. So you can specify what expression is valid in your context and what expression is not. Certainly in the context of Phoenix all expressions are valid because we made sure that all C++ is valid inside of, of Phoenix. But um, in other um, embedded domain specific languages you might want to um, inhibit the use of operator plus for instance or the use of operator minus. And then you can specify that by defining your own grammar rules what's allowed in the expressions, which expressions are valid in the context of your um, domain specific language which are not. So these grammars describe all valid expressions and based on those rules you define here you can perform actions on the AST, on the abstract syntax tree it generates. So every rule is associated with an action which is executed for the node the rule matched. Let's do an example. So the type generated from a proto expression is a instantiation of the proto expression class. For instance, if we have a simple Phoenix expression underscore one plus underscore two, what we get and what the compiler will generate from it is, or what the compiler will do when it sees that expression, it will invoke the corresponding operator plus, which returns a instance of the type proto colon colon expression tagged with a tag plus and wrapping up the two arguments it got. So it's really just a simple operator overload which converts our plus expression into a type representing that expression. Suddenly simplified. <laughs> Let's do another example. Let's say we have 1 plus 2 and we want to actually see what expression, what's the type of the thing which the compiler will generate. Uh, well, that's exactly your question you asked. That's not a valid proto and not a valid Phoenix expression, right? 1 plus 2 is just 3 and the compiler wouldn't even think about looking at Phoenix or proto to do something about it. And in that case we have to wrap one of the arguments into a val explicitly to tell the compiler the whole thing I want to interpret in the context of Phoenix. Because val is a Phoenix expression. And then the compiler will figure out by using the proper operator overloads that everything else has to be a Phoenix expression as well and it will work out. So val1 plus 2 will create a, will invoke that function in proto which is called make expression with that tag and the two arguments, the 1 and the 2 and it will actually create this template type which is a proto expression, proto tag plus and the second argument is a list of two terminals where each of the terminals is an integer. So that's a type which is generated under the hood by the compiler. And if you look closely, that type is a, is a hierarchy, hierarchical tree, which represents 100% the expression it has been generated from. That's one thing. The second thing is that Proto not only generates a type for you, but it holds all the values or all the arguments by reference. So essentially that is something in, in pseudo code again which tells you that the tree or that expression or the, the a instance of that type will hold two values, the one and the two. So if you want to have a visual representation you will see that it's a plus node, that's the outer one, with two nodes, uh, that's it, this expression and that expression which both hold an integer and one holds the one by reference and the other one holds the two by reference. Yes? So the proto list, that seems to be just a list of types? Don't ask, I have no idea. Ask Eric or ask Joel Foku. Um, there are more template arguments to that and, and so on, so please it's again simplified. But in the end it's not only a type list, it's some kind it's actually a fusion sequence because it not only represents the types but it also holds the references to the values. And all proto expressions are valid fusion sequences by the way. If somebody knows what fusion is. The type itself does not hold. So there is a type and there is a That's a type. Expression. That's a type. 
And if you create an instance of that type, you can have references to two arguments, right. which in that case is one and two. And Proto makes a compiler generate that type and generate an instance of that type which holds the references to its arguments. And that's why you have a one-on-one -on -one representation of the uh, expression you had in the beginning to the thing Proto generates from it, which is a hierarchical representation of your expression. Well, if I generate, by extension, I mean, this answers a whole lot of questions. Um, if I have val1 plus 2, and later on in the code I have val3 plus 4, I, the compiler only need, needs to generate one type. Yes, but two instances. And two different instantiations right, of that right, type. Right, right, right. Okay. So let's make, uh, have another example. Every Phoenix construct can be seen as an AST node of our Phoenix domain-specific language, which essentially is C++. And by composing these, we create bigger ASTs. If you look at a simple if with one placeholder and some expression in there, we will get that tree, for instance. So it's if, which has two nodes, the comparison and the shift operation, and these arguments. And that's what Proto is doing for us, and that's why we are using Proto underneath of Phoenix, because Proto generates these tree and these instances for us. We can later on look at and can do some, some useful stuff with it. Make sense? Okay, that's the last slide on Proto, just to give you an idea what we are doing with it. Uh, the Phoenix abstract syntax tree in Proto's world uh, we can use it to introspect and transform this abstract syntax tree in any way we like, right? It's just an instance of a type. And we can walk that type at compile time, and we can walk that type at that instance at runtime, because it's really just a tree. We can both do both, right? We can do transformations at compile time, we can look at the nodes, we can associate actions with it, and we can walk that instance, which is a tree structure, at runtime just by by iterating over, over that tree structure like over, over any other tree structure. Um, the lazy evaluation, and all of Phoenix is lazy, as you might already have guessed, because what I mean when I say lazy is that I am not creating the actual result immediately, but I wrap up the expression into a function object, which when invoked will give you the result. That's what I mean by lazy. And that evaluation of Phoenix can be just seen as a transformation of that tree we have. Or just walking that tree, right? If all nodes in that tree are function objects, all I have to do, I have to invoke them in the right order to get the result. The default predefined evaluation in Phoenix corresponds to normal operator semantics. That's C++ and C++. And by defining your own nodes, you can extend Phoenix in any way you wish, and that's what I am going to do in the next slides. You can customize the evaluation order. You can customize the evaluation scheme for certain predefined nodes. That's another example I want to show, if time permits. And uh, last but not least, uh, the third example I have, you can transform the tree before you even start evaluating, and you can do additional tricks. Even if I won't be able to go through all those examples, they are still in the, in the presentation. And I, if you're interested, just look there, and then we can start offline discussions uh, um, afterwards if you have questions. Okay, let's do the following. Let's say we have a OpenMP. Somebody knows, or who doesn't know OpenMP? OpenMP is a compiler. Um, it is a framework supported by certain compilers allowing to parallelize the body of, of loops based on, on some criteria. And the compiler usually guesses those criteria based on the analysis of the body. And all what you have to do, you have to insert a pragma open uh, OMP um, parallel 4 into your code to make the compiler parallelize that for loop. So that's the simplest way to do parallelization. And in that case, we have three arrays or three vectors, and all we want to do, we want to sum up these elements. And since these elements are completely independent from each other, I can parallelize these things in any way I want because I don't have any interdependencies, right? I always, each operation refers only to one index. So parallelization doesn't create any problems there. What I want to do, I want to express that same semantics in, in Proto. Uh, in, in Phoenix, excuse me. 
So what I want to do, I want to create a new Phoenix node, a new Phoenix expression, which I will call OMP4 underscore. This time I got the underscore, which essentially takes four arguments. The initialization clause of the for loop, the termination condition, the reinitialization clause of the for loop. These are all proto expressions and what has to be done in parallel. So this expression takes four arguments, uh, which uh, all of them are Phoenix expressions. So that's what I'm going to create on the next couple of slides and to show you how you can do that with, with, uh, with Phoenix. Well, the first thing what you have to do uh, is to create a function object which is doing the work, right? In that case, we create a function object which is called for evil or evil. It's not evil, it's evil, <laughs> for evil. Uh, with a overloaded function operator taking four arguments, that's our initialization, condition, step, and what we want to do. And the fifth argument is something Phoenix requires and passes along with the, with, uh, the arguments that somehow gives Phoenix the context of the evaluation of the tree. So this is, is something we, we just pass along with, with whatever we have, we don't care what it is. And all what we have to do in, for our actual work is to put that pragma openmp and execute the proper for loop, which gets its argument from evaluating the arguments with that context, where eval is a predefined function in Phoenix, evaluating, walking the tree from that point on down. Um, um, and the result of that is our initialization clause, the uh, termination condition and, and the reinitialization, and that's the, the evaluation. So that's exactly what we saw before, that when, when you create more complex function objects, you have to invoke all arguments to that function object themselves with the proper arguments in order to, make the, uh, to get the results. So that's the actual workhorse, and that's where the parallelization will happen. And everything from now on is really just scaffolding to plug that into the Phoenix framework and to execute it um, when needed. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So the first thing we have to do, we have to create the expression type. The Phoenix gives you a macro, which is called boost Phoenix define expression. The first argument is a list of namespaces, uh, which defines open p colon colon four, and four arguments. Remember, we had four arguments, okay? And each of the arguments and has to conform to a predefined Phoenix metagrammar. And that's those rules I was uh, mentioning in the beginning, um, whenever we want to define an expression in, in, in Proto, we have to tell Proto what expressions are valid for the different arguments of that expression. And Phoenix just predefines a metagrammar, which is a type which holds all the information Proto needs to know to figure out whether a certain expression is valid. And since all four arguments should be Phoenix expressions themselves, we just pass along the, the metagrammar which describes the valid validity of, of those arguments. This macro will define a whole bunch of types. Some of them we will see later on. The most interesting is probably OpenMP make4, which creates a new instance of that expression. Result of make4 gives you the type of that expression. And that's the corresponding proto grammar rule we will need later on. The rest uh, we won't see in that thing. Yes? Does this have to be the global namespace? That has to be in the global namespace. That macro definition, yes. But uh, the expression you create doesn't have to be. I mean, if you leave off the OpenMP, it will end up in global namespace, which might not be a good idea because the result of will end up in global namespace. So usually you just specify some, some namespace here. Step three is to create the generator for our OpenMP4. And that's essentially just a function which tapes, takes three arguments. And now I will come to who was asking about the, the um, square brackets. You will see it in a second. Because we can't pass all four arguments at once there. Right? We have, here, yeah, you have it here. Four, OMP4 takes three arguments, right? That's the function we want to create. It takes three arguments. And only that thing what is returned from four 
has to have an overloaded index operator. You see what's what happening. So we create a function, OMP4, taking three arguments, and that thing, what is returned from that function, has an overloaded indexing operator, which takes the fourth argument for the expression. And that's why, that's our four function, takes three arguments, and it returns something which has that argument. So I, I left it out here, but if you look at that slide, you see that that is that function object. So it wraps three of those arguments and has an overloaded indexing operator which accepts the fourth argument, the body. Okay? And all of those things are Phoenix, ob Phoenix expressions. Don't forget that. that all, everything is a function object here. So it holds on to the three arguments and then it calls this make4, that's the one which has been created by our macro, which actually creates the, the expression from all four arguments, because only at that point we have all, them, all of them together. And it's using openmp4 to create the thing and openmp result of make4 to get the type. So we don't have to worry about that. So we can use the Phoenix magic, which is doing all the grunt work underneath, which creates that type and which creates an instance of that type holding on to, to the function objects. And whatever it returns is a proto tree. Okay? You're getting more and more silent. <laughs> okay, and the last thing what we have to do, and that might be a bit uh, obtruse to you, is we have to define how to evaluate the new expression. Because so far we just created one, but nobody knows. Um, we still have to combine the tree we got with the function object we created in the first step. There's no connection yet. And the way to do that is to provide a template specialization of the Phoenix default action uh, of the embedded template when, which is inside the default actions of Phoenix. And we specialize it for our proto rule representing the whole thing. And what we are saying is, whenever you, compiler, see a rule of that structure, please evaluate our function object. That's for eval is the first thing we defined where the actual evaluation happens. And that's the rule which corresponds to the structure and which is matched by Proto. And Proto will make sure that whenever a, a tree comes along which has that structure, it will invoke that function object for us. I'm not going into the details here, but it's really highly, highly sophisticated and I'm not sure that even I understand all the intricacies here underneath. But that's the way you have to specify things. So we use the embedded template when, whenever we want to associate a certain grammar with a certain evaluation scheme, with an action. And the last thing what is left is we have to use it. Uh, we create a vector, three vectors actually. We create a big function object where we have our own OpenMP4 here. Nothing is just a predefined uh, Phoenix object which is doing nothing because we have no initialization clause. We want to iterate over all elements of A. We want to uh, increment all the iterators. And we, that's our expression we want to evaluate, right? We want to add up the pairwise elements of A and B and assign it to C. And here we see an additional construct we haven't been talking about. That's the so-called let clause, which allows us to define uh, local variables. And underscore one refers to A, underscore two refers to B, and underscore three refers to C. And here you can see, Christopher, how you can wrap up the, the different scopes and how you can combine placeholders from different scopes. Because the outer placeholders, one, two, three, refer to the arguments. And you define local variables. In that case, that's the iterators, which you then use in the inside that let, let scope. And that's it. So uh, is underscore a something special? Or is it a, <laughs> it's a predefined. Um, uh, when you want to define a local name in Phoenix, you have to use underscore a, b, c, d, e. So that's predefined Phoenix constructs representing local variables. And 
begin is just a ex extracting the begin iterator from the first container and second and so on. So A, B, C are iterators. And we use those iterators just in, in our newly created OpenMP for loop. Begin also begin? Yeah. As I said, all algorithms, all, all STL is essentially mirrored in, in Phoenix, and you can use all of those in, in a lazy way. So that's a lazy begin. Okay? So essentially that thing returns a function object which, when evaluated, gives you the begin iterator from the container it wraps. Okay? Yeah, you can do the same with this macro that turns a function. Yeah, but you don't have to because it's predefined. And the trick here is that now this gets executed in parallel. And whatever you put in between those braces will be executed in parallel because it ends up being executed inside that OpenMP parallel pragma, in that for loop which is wrapped in that pragma. Okay, questions? Yes? So the dereference of C, A, and B is really the dereference of the, of the iterators. Of those function objects when they're called right. the lazy way. Right, right, that's a lazy dereferencing. Right. <laughs> So everything is lazy, everything is a function object, and everything you see is a function object. But the, that's why I, I said in the beginning, C++ inside C++. You're using C++ features, but you're not getting what you think you get. You get a whole bunch of expressions which get evaluated at, at, uh, at runtime. There was another question. In this case, um, I'm worrying about implicit type conversion. So if you had a container of and a container of short or unsigned, would underlying code handle the implicit type of code, or do you have to explicitly provide one more It's C++. Whatever the template will work out to and whatever your overload set is, either the compiler will be happy with you or not. There's no magic, you know? It's really just C++ in disguise. But in the end, it's all about template instantiation, and the usual rules apply there, certainly. So uh, it's difficult to answer right now. But you see what I mean, yeah? Yes, please. Yes? Correctness. So, uh, yeah. you, you are always. <laughs> yeah, it should it should work. Uh, it should be cons correct. Yes. To um, so if we so begin here picks the uh, non const overload of begin. It depends on whether A, B, C are const or not. Okay. In that case, it will be non const because I'm passing in the the, the containers directly. It really depends on the context. Can you force it because you know in this case that A and B are going to be use R begin and uh, not R begin. It's it's C C begin and oh, C okay. end. Yes. Other questions? Yes. So, so I do get uh, the bigger picture of being lazy. It's yes. Just wonderful. Well, I hope so because as a developer, you are lazy by design. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I'm still trying to understand the bigger picture of Phoenix as a whole. Uh, now, do I start designing in my application using procedural, like functional approach? And uh. Uh, it's, it's a matter of taste in the end, uh, and it's a matter of preference, how you like to program. If you like programming in functional ways, and if you are coming from Haskell or so, then you might find that very comfortable, because you can think in those functional terms. Um, if you uh, are worried about compile times, you probably don't want to do that because, uh, I mean, boost, killing compiler since 1999, right? Uh, <laughs> that's going along those, way in th th those lines. Um, it, it, as always, I have to defer to your judgment, what you want to do. Um, certainly these big things uh, is something I don't expect somebody to use right now. It's more like an example to show you the complexity and, and the interplay of the different parts. One second, Bryce. And, um, but sometimes you really want to have that because it, it might be more expressive or it might, might just convey your idea in, in, in more explicit ways. And I believe the, the, the everybody has different criteria, but for me the criteria is readability of the code. Even if the reader doesn't really understand what's going on under the knees, it, just a, a bit of introduction will show the, or will, will make it understandable what, what is meant by that, right? And so, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. Yes, Bryce. Um, just as, as a remark on, on that subject, it's Phoenix is particularly useful if you've got another domain-specific embedded language, like Spirits, right. where 
you want to attach um, actions that are written as C++ style, and you need them to fit in well with Right. Other very, 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 uh, very good remark. So, spirit semantic actions, for instance, is where you could put these kind of things, and it will nicely blend with with spirit itself because it it is the same underlying mechanism. It's proto underneath. Um, Standard algorithms, when you want to fit in a function object, where you really want to execute only one thing and you want to be it expressive, why not use Phoenix? Why use a lambda function there where you have these additional things you have to specify? Generic coding is one thing where this really shines. When you have something which is in a library and you don't know at design time what types it gets invoked with, actually. I mean, that whole thing you're seeing here is, has nothing specific about a vector end. You can invoke that with arbitrary containers of arbitrary types. So if you have some need of writing a facility which is doing that for arbitrary number or different way, different container types and different con um, value types for those containers, then that might be the way to go, because it's a one thing right, a one time right, and then you can invoke it with whatever container you want to use it. You see, so genericity is, is one of the main main things here. Okay. Yes. So if, if you define a, a Phoenix expression, uh, it captures variables that are defined outside of it. No, I'm. That's the place where it's capturing them, right? I'm invoking that function object which I created here. Uh -huh. That thing, that let, returns a function object, which when return, uh, which when invoked with three arguments, which will yeah. will do that stuff. I know. I mean, this, in this particular case, it yes. doesn't happen. But, but you could, in principle, you take could a, a ref there. The a inside of this instead of underscore yeah. one. Right, you could put a ref a there, or even copy it in there if you want. You could do that. But so that, so that so would so defeat so the purpose, right? A, a uh, closure in this sense. Right, right, right. right. And, and with lambdas, you, you also, a lambda is also a closure, but. Uh, in Lambda, you can specify exactly what you're capturing. You're and doing it that. It protects you, you from, from capturing what you don't want. Yes, right. But here you can't, right? You can. You capture everything. No. You no. no. I mean, um, if you want to refer to something inside that expression, for instance, instead of writing underscore one, you want to directly refer to A. Yeah. Then you have to either write val A or ref A. You can't just put the A there because that doesn't mean anything. It's not a function object. You have to make a function object out of whatever you're capturing. So the capturing process is very explicit. You have to specify what you want to do. But you certainly, since it's a closure, you don't want to refer to something there. Or sometimes you might. I mean, yeah, unless you do, right? Okay, that's one thing. That's the first example I wanted to show. And the, the essence here is that we created a completely new Phoenix node and a completely new Phoenix expression, which really extends the existing Phoenix. The next example I wanted to show is uh, something very similar, but uh, here I, I'm not going to extend Phoenix, but here I'm going to reuse the predefined for operator, which Phoenix provides you with, and make it do ev evaluating whatever it, it is, it has inside its body in a different way. So in the first example, we created a completely new extension to Phoenix, which just adds to Phoenix. In that example, we will change the evaluation scheme of the predefined for operator in Phoenix. And uh, you might ask, why do you want to do that? The reason is, let's say I want to create a, not only, a, I don't want not only to parallelize for, but I want to parallelize more operations. For instance, I want to parallelize the comma operator. Just by specifying three things with a comma, I want to parallelize them automatically. And by creating a construct which reuses the existing sem semantics and its existing constructs, I just can um, m change the evaluation inside a open parallel OpenMP open parallel to be parallel only inside that body, inside that function, but outside it will use the, the, the predefined semantics of that for. So I don't have to introduce a new, uh, uh, a, a new node type there. 
So what we what I will show in that example is only how to change these evaluation uh, semantics for four, but you can extend it easily to do other parallel work there as well. Okay, how do we change the evaluation scheme for things in Phoenix? The first thing is again, let's define how to evaluate a new expression. And if you remember, um, uh, in the, in the previous example, we had that when construct where we just provided a new template specialization for our grammar rule extending the uh, Phoenix by specifying a new specialization. But we can't do that in that case because Phoenix already has a specialization for its own four. So we can't just provide a new one that would create a, a um, ambiguity. And that's why we have to go through or hop through a couple of hoops here. And we, we do that by uh, the usual way in computer science, when you have a problem, how to solve a problem, you add another indirection layer on top of it. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. We create our own parallel actions, which default to the default actions of Phoenix, and then we provide a specialization of the when only for Phoenix rule. We just add another special or another layer on top of Phoenix, which allows us to re-specify, re-specialize the predefined Phoenix rule, which is the rule corresponding to the four operator predefined in Phoenix. Okay? And here we reuse our function object we had in the very beginning with a pragma open openMP, which is doing the parallelization. So that's the very same function object. The only difference is that we uh, now associate that function object with the predefined Phoenix 4 operator, right? When is used to associate a certain rule, a certain node type described by that proto grammar with a certain function object. And that's really just to overcome that problem that we don't create a, a second specialization for, for that thing because Phoenix default actions when Phoenix rule 4 already exists and we can't provide a new specialization for that template, and that's why we have to add that interaction layer. Okay, now let's change the evaluation scheme. And if you remember, we wanted to create a OpenMP colon colon parallel, which again is a new construct, and in that case it's a Phoenix expression which takes one argument. So we, we already saw that, right? Boost Phoenix define expression, OpenMP parallel is a new name of the thing you want to create, and in this case, it, it takes only one argument. Whatever is inside its, its invocation, right? It's a function invocation, yeah. Um, let's see, what is that? I'm not going to explain that too deeply, but that's the incantation you have to use to make that OpenMP parallel to invoke our parallel actions here was one argument. It's really too sophisticated and too, too, too difficult to explain. Just take my word for it and look at the example which is in, in SVN to understand what's going on. Um, I'm just running out of time. That's why I'm, I'm trying not to explain that in, in that context. So the essence is that I really want to define a new expression and then I tell Phoenix how to evaluate that expression. And in that case we use protocol, we evaluate that new expression for that argument and we pass some contextual information along. Yes? So do you need a, so in your the, the desired syntax it has to be just one Phoenix expression, right? So it has to be parallel work, comma, something. Yes, right? yes, definitely, yes. I just left out the comma there. Okay, and the last thing is we have to define that function itself. That function. That function. It's a normal function which takes an arbitrary Phoenix expression and which creates a new node, same way as we saw it before, this time make parallel and that's the type of the new node, OpenMP result of make parallel, which is a type of the thing which, which gets created. So the last thing what's left, yeah, that's one argument again. And the last thing what's left is use it again. Here's our vector, here's that thing, but this time we don't ha use OpenMP for, but we use the normal for, which is wrapped inside our new construct. And when we invoke it, it will execute that thing in parallel. 
and actually everything inside that that scope. If I have two for loops in there, both of the for loops will be evaluated in parallel. Okay? Um, so again, the difference between the two is in the first case we added a whole new construct to Phoenix and told Phoenix how to evaluate that construct. In the second case we reused a predefined existing construct in Phoenix, namely the for loop, and gave it different evaluation semantics, different evaluation scheme, just by associating a new action with it. And that's why we had to go a bit deeper into Proto, because all the magic happens in Proto. And that's why we had to use that, that fairly complex Proto expression here. Here. Yeah. Okay? So if you wanted to put two parallel loops inside there, you would have to also overload the coma operators. Uh, if you want the two, yeah. uh, if you want the par the for loops themselves to be parallelized, uh, but if you only want to parallelize the first loop and then parallelize the second loop, you don't have to do anything in addition, because it will execute the first for loop in parallel, oh, okay. and then sequentially the second p for loop in but parallel as well. Run them in parallel. You have to overload the comma operator as well. Yeah. So you have to do the same magic, mm -hmm. uh, essentially that thing for the comma operator. Yeah. Um, here. No, not that thing. That thing. You have to do the for the com operator as well. Okay? Okay, how to use it? Fine. I'm almost done and I have five minutes left, so very good. The last example I want to show you is um, that what we have now is essentially really we, we can treat our code as data. And uh, everybody uh, probably knows that uh, famous uh, quote from uh, the Greenspan's 10th rule of programming that whatever you do, it's Lisp anyway, but in a crappy way. And, uh, but if you look at what we did with Phoenix, we have now both. We have the possibility to implement custom expressions and we have the ability to transform these expressions as we like. Essentially, we gained the powerful implementation of Scheme or some Lispish language on top of a data structure which is called a proto-expression. And what we can do, we, we just can use the normal C++ evaluation scheme and can use it um, a, to evaluate any expression we get. And we have additional facilities to change the evaluation of, of that tree. We can transform that tree. We can mangle it in any way we want. So we really gained the facility of treating our C++ code as if it was data. And we can pass that data around and we can do something different in different places to the data. So I, I really believe um, this time it's not a crappy implementation of Lisp, but it, it's, it's something really, really useful where you can... We, we can't even imagine now the power of, of what we gain with, with, that, with that Phoenix uh, uh, framework. So the last small example, which is even more proto, uh, I just want to do a trick um, by forcing Phoenix to invert the meaning of plus and minus and multiply and divide. So you just write A plus B and Phoenix will evaluate it as A minus B. And you write A times B and Phoenix will evaluate it as A divided by B. And it's really easy to do with Phoenix, as you will see. It's really done on 30 lines of code or so. Um, again, we have to define our own actions and by default these actions are deriving from whatever proto is giving you. And the reason why we have to use proto here is that this thing, that operation or that transformation will happen even before Phoenix come into play. That transformation will happen during the creation of the underlying expression tree by proto. So we, we just teach proto to, to do that trick for us and then we will use that generated tree and evaluate it with a normal Phoenix evaluation scheme. But at that point, everything is lost already because we already inverted the, the underlying mechanism. A lot of nice code, but what it's doing, it essentially says, whenever I see a rule plus, I invoke proto with a phoenix minus. And that's the left and right operand. And you do the same with minus. Whenever I see a minus, 
Proto will evaluate it as if it was a plus. Don't pay too much attention to the details of that code. I left out half of it anyway. But um, what I wanted to show is that just with, with a relatively straightforward incantation, if you know Proto and if you know Phoenix, you can do any arbitrary transformations on the tree which is generated from the expression you're looking at. Yeah, if you, if you have any questions, just ask me later. Thank you.